All right, we're looking at the book of Job today, or Job, all right, which some of you wouldn't like. All right, so we'll just call it Job. All right, so the book of Job today, and this morning we'll be looking, it kind of falls along with the testimony uh, about uh, being appreciative of being a son of God. And so we're going to be looking at the greatness of God this morning. So Job 37, and I'll read one verse and we'll come back to some text in the book of Job, be looking at the greatness of God this morning. So Job chapter 37 and verse 14, it says, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Uh, there's a funny story about the father of one of America's um, well-known poets, Emily Dickinson. And so Emily Dickinson's father one evening at the dinner hour uh, was outside, and all of a sudden the fire bell started ringing madly, and it was him. It was Emily Dickinson's father ringing the fire bell in their town. All the people in that little town uh, were eating dinner at that time, and so they came running out, clutching their napkins, their silverware, and some even bringing some food uh, with, uh, with them that they were eating, and they came out and they saw uh, Emily Dickinson's father with the ringer in his hand, and he said, I just saw the most glorious sunset, and I wanted you to see it. So he rang uh, the fire bell. He didn't want them to miss that beautiful sunset. Most of the town folk went back to their houses, shaking their heads, saying, Weird Dickinson is nuttier than a fruitcake. All right? But I tell that story as an introduction because I believe as believers, sometimes we need to be reminded of the greatness of our God. The whole world around us is throbbing with the life of God. Not just a beautiful sunset, not just the mountains, not just the storm at sea, but all around us, there's testimony to the greatness of God. And I'd ask you then this morning, this past week, have you considered the greatness of the God? Some of you claim to be a Christian, but your Christianity is wrapped up in you. Your, your whole life is wrapped up around you and, and maybe even in what people have done to you and what they haven't done to you. And what you haven't considered this week is what God has done for you. And I'd ask you this morning to pause and consider the greatness of our God. One lady wrote this, my God is great. His name is the greatest of all. My God is king. All others are weak and small. My God is great. His deeds are untouchable. My God is powerful. His purpose is are unstoppable. My God is great. He is victorious and courageous. My God is mighty. He is merciful and gracious. My God is great. His love is without measure. My God is faithful. He's the world's greatest treasure. Have you found the greatness of God? We're going to consider that this morning, and let's look at a couple of verses. Let's look at Psalm 36. We're in chapter 37, so let's look at chapter 36. And in chapter 36, look at verse 5. Behold, God is what? What's the word? Mighty. mighty. God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty and what? Strength and wisdom. Go down a little farther to verse 22 in chapter 26. Behold, God exalteth by his power who teacheth like him. All right, who's a teacher like God? Go down to verse 26. Behold, God is what? Great, and we know him not, neither can the number of his years be searched out. Then go to chapter 37. We'll start in verse 1. At this also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven and is lightning under the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth 
marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. Go down to verse 14. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Go down to verse 22 of the same chapter. Fair weather cometh out of the north. With God is terrible majesty. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. Men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come to you and consider the greatness of our God from this book, Job, at the end of his discussions, and as he has been suffering, he's starting to understand how great his God is. And I pray that this morning, just for a little bit of time, that we would be able to consider the greatness of our God. As always, Lord, I ask you to do that which I cannot do, and that is speak to hearts. We ask and claim your power in Jesus' name. Amen. Our theme is the greatness of God. The root of, of many of our problems, I would say the, we have many problems. One of the roots, I would say, is a misunderstanding, a, a misapplication of who God is and what he can do. The focus uh, for our world, and especially even right now, the focus of our world is on man, even with all the nuttiness uh, that's going on. Uh, what's amazing to me is that the focus is on man instead of on God. It is everywhere, this focus of, on man. Our society believes the most important question to answer. In fact, you may think this is the most important um, um, uh, important question is, who are we? Who is man? They are dedicated to it. There are seminars, there are books on it everywhere, and not just a few hundred. There are thousands upon thousands of books and titles in bookstores that are dedicated to one thing, helping, helping man find out who he is. The need in our generation is not to find out who we are. The question should not be, who am I? The question should be, who is God? Once we find out who God is, then we can understand who we are. And this, as a Christian, and I challenge you this morning, there are some of you that are really struggling in this area because everything is about you, and it's about finding out who you are and what's in your heart and what's in your mind, and you will never find any of that unless you go to this. Because this is our source as a Christian. The world has their ideas, the world has their philosophies, but until we come back to God and his book, we will be just foolish. In fact, I, I was talking to the singles about that on uh, Friday night. On Friday night, we were talking about trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine heart own understanding. And actually, if you go to Scripture, is it saying that understanding is bad? You know, I'm not supposed to have understanding. And then we looked at a couple of Scriptures because understanding is something we're supposed to desire. But the Bible says this, the Lord gives wisdom and understanding. That's where I go to. You see, on my own understanding, I will be a failure and I will be a fool. But in God's understanding and in his uh, seeking his way, I'll be able to understand more. So we're going to look at this idea of who is God. What is the, the greatness of our God? And there's four ideas that come through, and there's probably more through the book of Job. But through the book of Job, one of the themes is the greatness of God. Tonight we'll consider another theme, and that is the patience of Job. But one of the themes that comes out in the book of Job is the greatness of God. So turn to Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. Hopefully you have a Bible and you can turn there. That some uh, coming off the buses, you may not have a Bible. And so uh, we do have some pew Bibles uh, that are there to help you out. Or you can share with somebody in Job chapter 9. 
And the reason we do that uh, is to help you to show you that we are going to Scripture. We're not just making things up, all right? Job chapter 9, starting in verse 2, this is Job answering, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? So what is this saying? It is saying we cannot be just before God and anybody, and this includes Christians here this morning, it says if you harden yourself against God, you're no match for him. That's what it's saying. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? You say, wait a minute, I know a Christian. I know a Christian that's a multimillionaire and he's doing his own thing. Nah, wait till the end of his life. All right, this is not all that it's about. You think, and that's one of your problems, you think everything about your life and this life is right here. There's an eternal aspect, and that's what it's saying here. He is wise in heart, mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? Nobody, actually, is the answer. He is great. Uh, God is great, and our first point is he is great because he is sovereign. Notice in verse 5, which removeth the mountains, and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and it sealeth up the, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. First of all, our God is great because he is sovereign. What does it mean to be sovereign? I looked that up in the dictionary. Sovereign means supreme in power. Possessing supreme dominion, a sovereign, a ruler of the universe, supreme, superior to all others, chief. God is sovereign. That's what we're saying. And in Job chapter 37, our text where we started reading, we see that all life is at his command. Did you see that in Job 37? At this, also my heart trembleth and is moved out of his place. He Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency. He will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend." All through this uh, chapter in chapter 37, you also see it in Job 9, God rules this world. He is sovereign. All life is at his command. He controls the elements. Remember Christ when he was here on this earth on the Sea of Galilee and the disciples, they were kind of panicked because a storm had whipped up across the Sea of Galilee and as the Bible says, he was asleep in the hinder parts and they wake him up and they say, hey, we're going to die. And what does Christ do? Peace, be still. And everything stopped. God is sovereign. God is sovereign, and we must recognize that that's the greatness of the God that we serve. He controls uh, the elements. He controls the animals. It says that in verse 8. Then the beast goeth into the dens and remain in their places. You know why? Because God told them to go there. God can control anything. He is sovereign. He controls the elements. He controls the animals. He controls the supply. Where do we find that? In the text it says in verse 12, and it is turned around about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world and the earth. He causeth it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for his mercy. God can do whatever he wants because he's God. I can't do whatever I want because I'm a man. But God is sovereign he is great because he is sovereign. All life is at his command. He also accomplishes his will on this earth. Where do we see that? It's found in Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12, starting in verse 12, it says, With the ancient is wisdom, and in length of days understanding. 
With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leadeth counselors away spoiled, and maketh the judges fools. That's what we're kind of seeing in our nation today. There are people that have had so much education that it's astounding. It's astounding how much education they've had, and yet they are foolish. They are foolish, even this week. We have people that have studied law for decades, and they still can't figure out that God made them male and female. They can't figure that out. They can't figure out that there's men and women. I'm about ready to put a sign up for our academy, Fairhaven Christian Academy, where there's still male and female. All right? That's what people are like, whoa. You're, think about that. That's taking a stand today. All right? How silly of a, of a nation. They can't even figure that out. Can't figure it out. And yet, that's part of God. God can make people so silly. Silly. You know why? He's sovereign. He governs everything. He accomplishes his will on this earth. And believe it or not, his will is being accomplished on this earth right now. You may say, it doesn't make any sense. I know that. But I'm glad I can trust in a sovereign God, that's point number one. He is great because he is sovereign. Turn to Job chapter 11. We're there, and we finished up in chapter 12. So go back to Job chapter 11, and let's read verses 7 through 11. Canst thou, by searching, find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do deeper than hell? What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, then who can hinder him? For he knoweth vain men, he seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For vain men, man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him. If iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shall not fear. What is he telling us? That God, secondly, the first thing we saw, why is God great? Because he is sovereign. Secondly, he is great because he is unfathomable. All right, I said it kind of fast. All right? unfathomable, all right? I'm saying it a little wrong, too, all right? I put a big word in there that I can't even say, all right? But I can spell it, all right? I can spell it. So what do we mean by that? I looked up a, a Google search yesterday, and all I did was books on the greatness of God. Guess what I found? 1.3 million results. 1.3 million results. The massive amount of literature that is written is saying that, guess what? You can't search out God. It is without, you can read, and I have studied, all right? I started studying uh, uh, about God basically when I was in 10th grade. In 10th grade, God got a hold of me, and I started, I, I remember buying concordances and started studying in 10th grade. All right, so that's over three decades. I have been very serious about studying God and finding out God. And you know what? Every day, it seems like I find something that just is amazing. Because we can't search out God. His wisdom is matchless. His power is unsurpassed. His love is endless. And this is all backed up in Scripture. For instance... What about wisdom? In Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6, the Bible says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. In James chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So guess what God says? All wisdom 
is in me, and I can give it to you. That is God. And what's amazing about God, you know, there are some people or there are some items that if you go and you grab, uh, you take from it, let's say a store. I go to a store and I empty out the shelves. Yes, maybe they can go back and grab some more things and refill them. Um, but sometimes uh, you might go, and especially in this day and age with online, you go there and you go to order it and you put it in your shopping cart and you go to pay and it says, out of stock. And sometimes you come back to it and it says out of stock again and out of stock again. You know, you can go to God and all of us at the same time can go to God for wisdom and he can give all of us wisdom and it doesn't tap him at all. He didn't have to say, oh man, you know what? This guy over here, man, he was, he was really empty with wisdom. <laughs> I'm telling you, it could have been me. All right, I was going to God and I drained him. All right, I drained them all. No, that never happens with God. God, uh, it's, that's the idea that it's, he's unsearchable. All right? it's, it, it, there's not a limit to what God has. And so we see that with wisdom. We also see that with power. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. So what do we see about God? He has all wisdom. He has all power. He also is all love. The world doesn't understand it. 1 John 4, 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. All right, there are, there are some folks that go away from God. Even in the Christian circles, they go away from God, and guess what they start having a misunderstanding of? Love. They'll even come to their parents and say, you know what, you don't love me. And guess what, they're away from God. And they have a misunderstanding about love. Why? Because God is love. Without God, you'll never understand love. You'll never understand a love without God. And so uh, Romans 8, 39 says, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is the Bible uh, telling us? The Bible is indicating to us that God, uh, it's unsearchable. What do we mean by unsearchable? All right, there is wisdom, there is power, there is love. All right, so that is our second point about the greatness of God. God is great. Why? Why is great, uh, God great? Well, because he is sovereign. Secondly, he is great because he is, where's that big word? Oh, thank you. All right, I'm going to have you say it, not me, because I say it wrong every time. So he is great because he is? All right, thank you. All right, thirdly, he is great because he is all-sufficient. He is all-sufficient. That's found in Job 22, Job 22, verses 1 through 4. This is Eliphaz, the Tenemanite. Eliphaz, the Tenemanite, is answered, and this is what he says. Can a man be profitable unto God as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Will he reprove thee for fear of thee? Will he enter with thee into judgment? And what do we mean by that? What is God telling us? He's asking, do I need man's help? Does God need our help? Does he need our help for judgment? Does he need? No, he is all sufficient. One of the greatest names, I love studying the names of God, and in Genesis chapter 17, we have the first time that one specific name of God is used, and it's found when God was talking to Abraham in Genesis 17. And in Genesis 17, 1, 
God tells Abraham, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. That name for God in the Hebrew is El Shaddai. All right, now, we've been hearing that name if you've been coming on Thursday nights because we've been reading and discussing the Holy War. All right, and Prince Emmanuel, all right, Prince Emmanuel, uh, the prince uh, is coming from uh, Shaddai, all right, remember Shaddai? Well, El Shaddai is a name from God. That's where John Bunyan got the idea from Scripture. And in Genesis 17, 1 is the first time that this name, El Shaddai, is used. And basically, what God was telling Abraham, Abraham is 99 years old, and he was promised that he would, he would have a seed that would basically produce a, a nation that would be endless that the, the sands of the, the, sands of the, the sea, all right, the seashore, uh, it would be more than the sands of the seashore. So he's 99. He doesn't have a kid. And he's probably thinking, like some of you that are not 99, but maybe 82, all right, and thinking, no, I'm not thinking this is happening. And guess what God said? You can trust in El Shaddai. What does El Shaddai mean? All right? It means the almighty God. It means the all-sufficient one. What was he telling Adam? You can't do this, but I got this. Remember, uh, I think it was Clint Reardon on Sunday night was kind of referencing that, that, hey, I got this. That's kind of a phrase now. Hey, I got this. No, you don't. On your own, you'll probably fall flat on your face. But I'm glad that I have a God that is all-sufficient. What do we mean by all-sufficient? It means that God Almighty is sufficient to supply all my needs. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need my guidance. He doesn't need my money. He doesn't need my resources. He doesn't need my talents. Now, he chooses out of his grace and mercy, he chooses to use man. And sometimes I think he's pretty disappointed. But God is sufficient. He is sufficient. There's a couple of uh, passages that show this in Scripture. One is, if you want to turn there, Psalm chapter 46. Psalm chapter 46. It's a great passage that reveals the sufficiency of our God. So Psalm 46, it's only 11 verses. So let's do this, um, if, if you can handle this. Let's read all 11 verses and we'll read it responsibly. All right, so what do we mean by that? I read one verse, then we all read a verse together. So we'll read uh, Psalm 46, all of it together. And let's see if this helps us out with the all-sufficiency idea of God. So I'll start in verse 1. Then together we'll read two, I'll read three, and we'll go down through verse 11. All right, starting in verse one with me. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Together, therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. I'm reading, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah, together, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariots in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Alas, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. What is the Bible telling us? you can rest in the sufficiency 
of God. You can, you can try on your own to take care of all kinds of different things, but at some point in your life, even as a Christian, at some point, God will probably bring you to a place that you realize that your sufficiency in yourself is helpless. You can't, you can't, you can't make it. You can't meet it. You can't meet the needs. And God brings us to that point, and that's why I believe the book of Job is there. Job, although he was a good man, and you read that in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, and actually his friends were a little off on that. They came and they were peppering him, saying, you must have sinned, you must have did this, and you must have did that. But at the end, Job, God did kind of scold Job a little bit because he had some sufficiency in himself instead of God. And all through the book of Job, and it's written for us, for our admonition, it's written for our instruction, so that we can come to the book of Job, and sometimes God sends something into our lives to help us to understand that we are weak, we're frail, we can't do this, I don't got this. But with God, I have El Shaddai. I have a God that is sufficient to meet my needs. And I must rest on him. And that goes against, that goes against even the American dream. It goes the, uh, against the idea of, man, I'm not, I'm not dependent upon anybody. I'm independent. I understand that as far as being an independent Baptist church. But guess what? There is never a time in your life here on this earth that you are supposed to be independent of God. It is not found in Scripture. I am always to be dependent upon the sufficiency of Christ and of my God. The last point that we see here this morning is found in Job chapter 26. Job chapter 26. So, he is great. Why is God great? Because he is sovereign. He is great because he is. Secondly, what's the word? Thank you again. Number three, he is great because he is all-sufficient. And fourthly, he is great because he is all-knowing. Look at chapter 26. This is Job answering. And Job answers his friends. And this is what he says. We'll pick it up kind of in the middle of the chapter in verse 6. Hell is naked before him. Destruction hath no covering. So who is this talking about? God. Everything's open before God. That's what he's saying. Destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent unto them. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? All right, it's talking about power, but also it's talking about his understanding. Everything is open before God. Why? Because God is great because he is all-knowing. He knows everything. The Bible teaches that God is an all-knowing or omniscient God. The word omniscient comes from two Latin words, omni, which means all, and uh, scientia which means knowledge. So it's, when you put omniscient, when we say God is omniscient, we are saying that God has all knowledge. When you say that God is omniscient, it means that he has perfect knowledge of all things. God even knows the things that humankind has yet to discover. He knows everything. It's interesting, we find this in Scripture revealed to us. Remember Hannah? Hannah who wanted a son. And in Hannah, uh, Hannah records the words in 1 Samuel chapter 2. 
it says, talk no more. And then the prayer of Hannah, the mother of Sam, Samuel, she reveals this truth about God in 1 Samuel chapter 2. She says, talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. You know what Hannah was saying in her prayer? She was saying that God knows everything. And she was, she was saying this because uh, she was being judged. She was being judged by a priest. She was being judged, and uh, uh, the priest didn't know. The priest thought that she was drunk, right? The priest, the prophet, thought that uh, Hannah had uh, gotten tipsy, and something was wrong, and she was this there praying in agony before God, and she comes to God and says, God weighs everything. He knows everything. He's the God of knowledge. Another passage that I think... Um, that I like reading is found in Psalm 139. And Psalm 139 in verses 1 through 6, if you want to turn there, if not, I can read it. But in Psalm 139, it says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path uh, and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. And then he starts saying, well, where can I go from his presence? And he couldn't go anywhere. But in the first part of this, the psalmist is saying that God knows everything. Even the words that you're going to say, he knows them. That's the knowledge of our God. He is all-knowing. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 147 in verse 5, he says, great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. What does it mean by saying infinite? The greatness of our God. There's no limit to our God's knowledge. And so I, I ask you this morning, all right, we had a testimony about having fathers, about the greatness of fathers. But one application this morning can be, do you know God as your father? Because God as your father, what have we, what have we seen? He's sovereign. When you step into God's family, he rules and reigns. He rules and reigns everything. That's who's in charge of your life now. He is sovereign. He's unsearchable. That's what we saw in our second point. And then we saw that he is all sufficient. And so that's why you can come to God the Father this morning and you may not know on your own you're saying, well, I can, I can get to heaven. I can do this. No, you can't. But in God, there's all sufficiency. He's taking care of everything. And then also we see that he has infinite knowledge. He's all-knowing. Man, what a great father we have. God the Father. What a great God we have. But I wonder this morning, even as Christians, have you been relying on yourself? Man, that's a, that's a big thing today. It's a big thing today to, man, I'm a self-made man and you know, I, 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 can, I got this, I can do this. I understand about character, and we should be working towards having character. I don't, I'm not saying we should have a characterless society. I believe through Scripture that, and it's taught that there should be some integrity and there should be some character, but I think that uh, a lot of Christians today, they are relying upon themselves. They are sufficient in themselves, and then every once in a while, like, hey, God, can you take care of my eternal things? And God is great. He's sovereign. He's sufficient. He has all knowledge. And so why do you just sit down with him once in a while? There's a story in a book. It was called The Cloister and the Hearth. Or The Hearth. It was The Cloister and the Hearth. And it, it told the story about two men. At one time, there was two men, and they were backpacking their way across Europe. 
and it was very, uh, during a very dangerous time. And one of the men was always trying to encourage his partner who was getting discouraged because it really was, it was, it was pretty rough times that they were walking through Europe backpacking. And so the one friend would always look to his other friend and say, courage, my friend, the devil is dead. Courage, my friend, the devil is dead, which is not true, all right? But as I read it, you know what? I can tell you, courage, my friend, God's alive. Courage, my friend, God's alive. He's sovereign. He's unsearchable. He's all-knowing. He's, he has all sufficiency. So why are you latching your life on yourself? How's it going? Oh, you're pretty depressed, aren't you? You're mad at the world, angry at everybody around you. You know why? You've forgotten there's a sovereign God, and we serve a great God. Why not bow before God again? Turn your life over to him and realize that God is alive and you can trust him and you can trust him because he's all-knowing. You can trust him because there's all-sufficiency in him. You can trust him. God is good and he's good all the time. He's good all the time. And that's why Job is written to us. Even in times of suffering, even in times of heartache, what did Job find? he found that there was an encouragement. And the encouragement was found in some ways in understanding the greatness of his God. Heads bowed, eyes closed this morning.